So thanks for being here today. I'm going to speak today about medical image analysis, virtual and augmented reality, and artificial intelligence. These are three important topics today in, in new technologies in medicine, but perhaps uh, at first glance seem, uh, seem a little bit unrelated. So my goal here today in the next 10 minutes is to tell you a little bit about how these are related to each other, what we can learn from each one, um, to maybe give you some perspective on how these technologies can be applied. This is sort of maybe what you think of when you think of a user using a us uh, virtual reality device. This is an Oculus Rift uh, with touch controllers. It's, it's distributed by Facebook, or it's made by Facebook now. We presume in this scene that this user is playing some kind of game, although you can also imagine within the medical context that this user could be exploring some kind of virtual reality uh, representation of the anatomy, either for educational purposes or for, uh, for a host of other uh, kinds of uh, potential applications of virtual reality and augmented reality that we'll discuss in just a little bit. So here's an example of a, of a volume rendering or a, um, a virtual object uh, that one could interrogate and to and fly around in a virtual reality environment to study the anatomy. This is actually courtesy of uh, the research group at uh, Siemens down in Princeton, New Jersey. And this is their cinematic rendering technology, which, which produces some pretty spectacular visualizations. Uh, in fact, I think it sort of looks like the Body Worlds exhibit or something, even maybe potentially photorealistic uh, in quality. It's, it's really quite interesting. So that's in a virtual reality kind of uh, situation. We, uh, we also, in uh, today's you know, next generation technologies of medicine, make use of augmented reality. And the difference, of course, between virtual and augmented reality is in virtual reality, we're, you're really in your own virtual space. It is completely divorced um, from the real world. Um, whereas in augmented reality, we integrate information from both the real world and, uh, and the virtual space or the virtual objects that we are injecting into the scene. So this is an example that uh, comes to us from Microsoft, who is a very uh, a well-known platform for augmented reality these days, their HoloLens product. Um, this is, uh, again, a medical education-based uh, virtual re augmented reality experience where someone is uh, looking at the heart, clipping into the heart, understanding the internal anatomy, uh, and doing that interactively uh, with information both from the real world, so you see that this person can see the whiteboard behind them, as well as the, the heart itself, which is, uh, which is projected onto that space. Maybe lastly, in terms of, uh, in terms of imaging and, and, uh, and, and what we do with these kinds of things, uh, you can think about uh, automated car, uh, I'm sorry, self-driving cars. So this is an example from Uber. Um, why I integrate all these things together when we talk about virtual and augmented reality and machine learning is really that fundamentally each one of these technologies are back-ended on medical image analysis within the context of, uh, of medicine. Um, certainly, driving a self-driving self, a self -driving car is not uh, is not something that comes is not uh, is not based on medical imaging analysis, but it is based on uh, imaging analysis. And a lot of the same techniques that we use for all of these different applications um, are actually very similar. The key goal when we talk about putting all these things together, these different applications together uh, within the context of medical imaging analysis, is how to turn medical imaging data, or really any imaging data, whether it's 2D, 3D, from medicine, from a self-driving car, into some kind of knowledge about what's happening, and then how to use that knowledge effectively, um, how to consume that information. So if you're a surgeon, you might use that for educating yourself about a particular case that you're about to encounter in the OR. Uh, if you're a self-driving car manufacturer, you might use that information to inform yourself about what's around you so you can avoid obstacles. So in general, we, uh, in medicine, when we talk about imaging analysis for the purposes of uh, these structural representations um, of reality, uh, we, generally, we generally look at this as a multi-step process where we start with imaging data. Um, we gather some information about how different types of imaging data is, are related to each other. We call that the registration process. Um, and from there, we, we try to extract detailed knowledge about the underlying uh, structures that are represented by the image. So we call this process segmentation. Um, and from there, once we have our segmentation, we can use that data in a whole variety of ways. Uh, we can use them in a VR headset. We can use them in an AR headset. Um, we can use them in a heads-up display. I'll show you a little bit about that. Um, and then we can augment our ability to structurally segment by leveraging some deep learning tools. And I'll, I'll briefly mention that. This is an example of what a segmentation like that might look like. Uh, we have a, uh, the underlying scan data that we're looking at here is actually a T1 MRI of the brain, a single axial slice of the brain. And this is the output from an automated segmentation pipeline uh, that is useful for normal brains or nearly normal brains, uh, which gives you automated information about the locality of certain underlying brain structures, certain underlying subcortical structures. 
So here you can see on the right hand side of the slide you have uh, red uh, which generally in indicates CSF and in the middle you have the ventricles. You also have easy to differentiate gray and white matter differen differentiation which are represented in green and blue as well as some other structures in different parts of the brain. So that's an automated tool uh, for semantically segmenting the brain into the, uh, into the its underlying structures. Uh, there are other types of techniques that we use that are more expert driven, uh, meaning that they require some level of uh, user interaction uh, to teach the tool how to segment structures from the underlying image data. This is an example uh, that actually comes from 70 MRI data, a TOF data set, which is particularly good for looking at arterial vasculature. And uh, what you see is our structural segmentation of that data, uh, which was with a custom tool uh, specifically uh, targeting vascular structures, tubular structures. Once we have all of those structures from medical imaging data or from anywhere, uh, anywhere else, uh, we can build, uh, we can relate the models to each other, and then we can inject them into uh, s some method uh, of consumption. So in this talk, we're talking about augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, so the model data is used as input to some kind of framework. Uh, what's really nice that's happened in the last five years in augmented reality and virtual reality, the, the massive in interest in this topic from all sorts of different fields, um, has resulted in a number of very general purpose frameworks, software frameworks that can be used uh, whether you are dealing with uh, an Oculus device or an HTC Rift or, or, a, uh, or any of the other types of AR or VR types of platforms. Um, so we, one of those is called Unity. I have that up here on the screen, although there is no shortage of other types of rendering uh, and game engines that can be used as the framework to display all this information. Once we have that segmentation data, we simply give it to the framework and then we give it to the, to the uh, augmented reality or virtual reality platform. Uh, in the case of virtual reality, our job is almost done to some extent. Virtual reality headsets are, are spectacularly complicated and, and implement all sorts of really interesting head tracking and, and they're a great achievement. However, ultimately, they really just are a couple of displays with fancy optics and then all of this extra head tracking on top of it. Um, so once we have the scene and we can render it uh, and we can put it on, let's say, a computer display, there aren't that many steps to, from that to getting it into a headset and al allowing you to look at it in 3D in a virtual reality environment. In contrast, augmented reality presents a couple of extra challenges. These are typically uh, because of the relationship between the data that's in the virtual environment and, uh, the, and the real environment that that data is being projected into. So you can imagine an equivalent scenario or analogy that we like to use is, is a heads-up display in flight simulation, where the information that is projected in the heads-up display, in this case, lots of technical information about the plane itself, as well as an overlay of the runway. So in principle, if it was dark, you would still know where it was. Um, that information has to be related somehow, and that does present some extra challenges. We solve those in medicine uh, typically with, uh, with an extra step of virtual to, to uh, real-life registration and navigation, which is, um, which is a technology very similar to GPS in some ways uh, that relates the digital, the digital information to the real world. Uh, what does that look like when we actually do this in the OR? This is an example from a case in neurosurgery. What you see here is uh, a surgeon attempting to, uh, attempting to get through some soft tissue. Uh, the, the relevant uh, information here is that actually right behind that soft tissue are a number of really key structures. In this case, we have two carotid arteries. Uh, it's very important that you do not nick those. Uh, and so what's happening here is that structural information is registered to the real world, projected onto the microscope screen that the surgeon is looking at, and so they know precisely behind where is, uh, is, the, is each one of these carotid arteries that they want to avoid. The applications of augmented reality and virtual reality have been I've been pretty significant. Uh, the, 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 it's definitely still in its nascent stage, but um, we've seen significant applications in education. That perhaps is the most, really the biggest hitter. Um, interacting with three-dimensional data is a fantastic way to learn anatomy as well as, as, as uh, other things. Um, we've seen it applied in patient communication and engagement, so communicating with the patient about their own uh, pathology or about their own disease or what's going on with them. Uh, we've seen it in preoperative surgical planning, interoperative structural information, giving surgeons extra awareness about what's going on with three-dimensional information as opposed to just 2D imaging data. We've also seen very interesting applications in pain management and rehabilitation um, that, uh, that we won't have time to talk about here today, but that are, that are really quite interesting. So why do I combine all of this with deep learning? What is the relationship between medical imaging and AR and VR and, and deep learning or machine learning? And, and really, the reason that I do this um, is because deep learning is providing, among many other things, with many other applications and many other underlying data sets, 
uh, a new avenue toward image analysis. And it does that by automating the process of engineering features uh, that are learned and then can be used to classify images. So if you want to classify um, a radiological scan that does and does not contain a hip fracture, that would be a way to do it. Uh, in general, um, these things in medicine are used for classification tasks, especially in the imaging space, um, but not limited to the imaging space. But of course, deep learning is useful for many other things. I have an example here of uh, some recent results from Google where they take some very low-quality images and turn, turn them into really very, uh, very spectacular what look like pro-quality images using deep learning. The result of these uh, pipelines can be used for the same kind of semantic or scene-based uh, segmentation that we really want when we build models in medical imaging uh, on that kind of radiological image data. Here you see a hypothetical view through uh, deep learning uh, lens of what a car sees when it is segmenting a scene into specific objects, sky, a building, a pole, a road marking, a road. And so this is, a, this is an inference method once the model has been trained that gives you all of that structural information about the scene in a, perf in a really automated way um, that abstracts the user from having to do that kind of work manually like what we typically have to do now in medical imaging. Um, lastly, I just want to say that although, you know, in, in deep learning and a lot of these machine learning techniques, uh, these are seemingly very complicated uh, technically uh, demanding uh, disciplines, uh, what we actually find is that the vast majority of the work today, uh, the most important work that goes on to building models that can enable uh, these kinds of deep learning applications are really about the data. And it is the clinicians and it is the people with domain specific experience and the kinds of questions that need to be answered uh, with an automated classification or other deep learning technique that really hold the key uh, to teaching those of us who build these kinds of um, these uh, deep learning pipelines and other kinds of image processing pipelines uh, to solve those problems. Thank you very much.